Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, and if you do it before September 20th, you'll get a 20% discount. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to this show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. I hope, I want to try and work on orange pitting the Muslim world. They're very resistant and hesitant and hostile to the idea. Every time I talk to an Arab about it, they think I'm trying to sell them a Ponzi scheme. And you can kind of understand because everybody's trying to set up Ponzi schemes these days. So immediately you're going to think Bitcoin is a stupid Ponzi scheme. But really, if you look into it, I think, I don't know if you've heard the podcast that I've had on this issue on Islamic finance and the Bitcoin. Did you see, hear them? No, not yet. I will. I've, I've had about four episodes. You can see if you go to my page, safedean.com slash podcast, you'll find um, tags for different uh, topics. One of those topics is Islamic finance. And then you can click on that and you'll see the four different episodes. One was with Harris Irfan. One was with uh, Safdar Alam. 
and one was with uh, Tariq Adiwani. And uh, yeah, so we've discussed this before, and I think there is an unimpeachable case to be made that not mm-hmm. only is Bitcoin halal, but Bitcoin necessarily makes the dollar haram. Bitcoin necessarily means that the dollar becomes haram. I think before Bitcoin, you could sort of understand the uh, fatwa that says that using the dollar is halal because you can see how not using the dollar and not getting into riba and not getting into debt is almost like financial suicide in a world in which fiat is constantly being devalued. And this is something that I, um, that I discuss in depth in the fiat standard. So you're constantly devaluing the currency. And so if you're holding savings and if you're not in debt, you are constantly using your purchasing power, which is what happens if so you are... So let me are... just interrupt you here. Look to safe. That's about the fractional reserve itself, but it's not about the banking system. I mean, fractional reserve is, is the one it, which do this uh, riba. Or... Yes, fractional reserve and also, you know, fiat monetary inflation to finance the government, issuing treasuries, mo- okay. government borrowing, okay. but all of all, uh, going off gold as money. And going on to what fiat money is ultimately is riba. It's, it's users loans by Islamic definition. It is exactly. clearly users. Now you, you can see that it is clearly haram because it involves uh, lending with interest. And, um, but you can see why you could argue that there is no alternative. If you're a Muslim, uh, you, if you're a Muslim living in 1995 or 2005, you have to, you know, you're running a business in anywhere in the world and you have suppliers and purchases all over the world. You need to be using a foreign exchange market. You need to be sending money abroad and you need to be financing your business operation. You have no choice but to deal with uh, the dollar. There was a monopoly effectively that was centered around the dollar. I mean, there were some alternatives here and there, but predominantly it was the dollar. And if you wanted to enter a large market, you need the dollar. And the alternatives, uh, you know, gold was not an option. You can use gold in day-to-day dealing. You can use gold to save, which a lot of Muslims do. And not just Muslims, people all over the world do that. But it's not useful as a business money because your business operates at a frequency and at a speed that is much higher than the speed of gold. So moving bits of gold around every time you make a payment for a supermarket or for, um, you know, any kind of modern business is highly inconvenient. So... You have to rely on a banking system, and the banking system is monopolized to use fiat money and run the um, Bank of England uh, model of uh, shitcoin, essentially. So I can understand before Bitcoin that you could argue, perhaps from a religious perspective, in the same way that let's say you found yourself on an island where the only thing that exists that you can eat is pork, and the alternative was dying. You can see how you could argue that, you know, you, you wouldn't want to kill, starve and so you could eat pork. So you could use the dollar, you could eat pork while you're on this island, as long as there are no alternatives to pork, right? <laughs> so you could use riba, you could use the dollar, I think, as long as there were no alternatives. And you could argue whether yes or no, it, that is a legitimate argument or not, but still, it's a legitimate argument that only wor- it only works anyway if there are no alternatives. If you discover cows on that island, no more bacon for you. <laughs> you have to eat the cows now. You can't go and eat the uh, pork. So now we have cows, basically. <laughs> That's what Bitcoin is. It's a beautiful metaphor. It works out very nicely. Bitcoin is cows. Bitcoin is halal. Bitcoin has no riba. And Bitcoin allows you to do anything the dollar allows you to do. So you want to send money across national borders. You don't need to go through the RIBA system. You don't need to go through the usury system. You can go through Bitcoin. You want to save. You want to hold savings. You don't need to buy government bonds. You don't need to hold US dollar physical cash. You can just stack sats like a civilized human being and like a halal human being as well because... Nowhere in the operation of Bitcoin is there any riba involved. Some people might use Bitcoin for riba, but they can also use gold for riba. But that doesn't concern you. With the dollar, on the other hand, it does concern you because riba is baked in at the protocol level. It's not just that there's these pieces of paper. This is, this is a key point that I discussed in the fiat standard in that fiat money is not 
physical pieces of paper. Physical paper is about 5 or 10% or so of fiat money. The real supply of fiat money, the vast majority of the supply of fiat money, around 90%, is digital money. And that digital money is created when debt is created. That's the key thing to understand. So there has to be riba in order for the dollar to come into existence. And then once the dollar comes into existence, then they make your physical dollar. So even if you're just using physical dollars and you're saying, you know what, I'm not using the banks, I'm not taking loans, I'm not lending, I'm not taking interest, I'm just using the physical dollars and I'm storing them in my home and trading with them, you're still dealing with riba because it took riba, it took somebody to participate in riba for your dollar to be issued. And so therefore, I think there is an Islamic imperative. If you're a Muslim, there is an imperative to be using Bitcoin. It's not just that it's halal and it's cool to be using it as a Muslim. I think you need to ask yourself, um, now you you don't have an alternative. You don't have an excuse anymore to continue to use the dollar. You have an alternative. You have no reason to be eating the pork anymore. So why are you? My yeah, my, my question isn't isn't it the same? I understand one BTC is equal one BTC. So isn't it the same now when we go to trading markets and hope that the one Bitcoin became uh, sixty thousand dollar or or sixty five thousand dollar? We again have in the back one of our mindset that the dollar is the reference still there. So wherever we go now, I I I. I uh, I just abstracted like uh, uh, one uh, uh, balancing everything in the world in one hand and every and the dollar in the other hand. That's that's the right situation. Even the Bitcoin. So if you go to the traders uh, and ask them about Bitcoin, he will tell you that I am there for trading because the Bitcoin is going to reach 100k, 150k. So we are still in the same monetary system, even though that the Bitcoin itself as a decentralized. Uh, uh, coin and it's it's totally uh, it's totally perfect. It's totally killing the fractional reserves, killing any uh, 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 riba on on their systems. I understand that very well. But we get we took this beautiful decentralized coin and just throw it in the same uh, uh, fiat system that the world running on stock markets. And we cannot just we cannot just take this all down to the ground and say we have to start something new to match uh, the Bitcoin. Is is that the case, Mo? This is my question. I think you know um, I I don't agree with you. I don't think of the world in terms of dollars anymore. I think of the world in terms of Bitcoin. And I think you know people think this is crazy, but no, it's. Um, I, I think a lot of people eventually make that mental switch. You stop thinking about the world in terms of dollars, and the world makes a lot more sense um, if you are into Bitcoin, because ultimately. Um, you realize once once you're really into Bitcoin, once you hold a significant percentage of your wealth in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. it becomes clear that the world, all the other alternatives that the world can offer are constantly devaluing. And so as you're measuring against them, you're witnessing you're witnessing everything that you measure with them get messed up. Whereas with Bitcoin, Exactly. You know it's heading up. And so, in a sense, it also even makes more sense because um, once a significant, once a majority of your portfolio perhaps is in Bitcoin, let's put it this way, then mathematically, um, everything for you needs to be calculated in terms of, it's better for you to think in terms of Bitcoin at that point because, you know, you think, for instance, if this is your net worth, then you think about how much you're going to be spending on a house or on a car. It is a function of your net worth. So you need to think of those expenditures in terms of Bitcoin, because your net worth is kind of Bitcoin. So if your net worth goes up, the um, amount of, um, you know, the the amount that you're able to get in fiat terms goes up. And so you think of those things, you you calculate them in terms of uh, Bitcoin, in order to think of them in terms of your net worth. So I think over time, this is just a mental habit thing. And if you look at early Bitcoiners, people who have been in Bitcoin for years, they do make this mental transition 
and they do start thinking in terms of satoshis and in terms of bitcoins and um yeah look uh it, it's we're not waiting for anything and we're not i i don't see the reason for um why bitcoin needs to um be added into the system because bitcoin functions completely independently of the system but it allows us to do everything that the system does and so it makes the system obsolete and so you know whether they want to get this early or they want to get this late that's uh, their choice <laughs> Our guest today is Safdar Alam, who is Chief Executive Officer at UK-based Maidan Capital and the former Global Head of Islamic Structuring at JP Morgan. For, for many people who are listening here, uh, I presume just the entire idea of Islamic finance seems like uh, an alien concept. Why should a religion have its own financial system? So uh, could you give us a little bit of, a, of your idea about what is the core of Islamic finance? Uh, how it differs from the um, mainstream fiat finance? Okay, I guess one way of approaching it is to say that the, our in, in Islam, we are told our approach to money and finance, it's not distinguishable to our approach in everything else, which means that it must be driven by values that we are informed that are important. Um, and so, so this broadly, this relates to ethics. So in the sense that, you know, how we, so there's different classification of rules in, in Islam. One is our relationship with our creator, for example, how we worship. And we're told how that should be because we shouldn't transgress, transgress beyond certain bounds. And also we're told how to deal with people. You know, there, um, no, no, not all things are legal rules, but we're told, you know, uh, not to lie with people. If you give your word, you should, you should hold on, you should hold on to it. And also we're told, less legal issues as well. We're told how to interact with our parents, for example. We're told how to interact with our children. And so these are all different aspects of rules. And the same, the same applies to money and finance. We are told how we should interact with money, how we should interact with people when it comes to money, and how we should deal, how we should handle ourselves when it comes to transactions. And so initially, a lot of these rules are, are kind of prescriptive. It tells us, you know, you should do this, 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 or you should not do this, this, this. And often, What's told to us are, it's quite simple things, you know, especially when it comes to finance, because remember these rules were, well, these rules were revealed to us for, uh, either in the Quran itself or early on at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, which was in the, you know, in the seventh century. So the way the rules presented to us are consistent with that time. For example, it, uh, we're not told about how to, how to invest in financial markets. When we're not told about how to deal with um, inst institutional activities that might not be socially responsible or, or consistent with the environment. But, but we're given basic principles, we're told. For, and so the main principles, I think one that most people would know if they're familiar with Islamic finance, one is there's a prohibition of lending with interest. We are allowed to, we are allowed to lend money and incur debt, but uh, nobody's allowed to benefit from it. So you must repay only the principal. And so lending at interest is, is forbidden in the strongest terms. And there, but there are many other aspects of business that we're told to avoid or, or to do so. And, and, and they're quite simple things, to be honest. We're told not to lie and not to deceive each other, to be honest in our dealings. And interestingly, we are, we are told about certain transactions. And, and when these examples are given, these often uh, what's involved, the commodities involved are often gold and silver, because this was money at the time. But also examples were given referring to dates and wheat, and we're told some certain kinds of transactions are not permissible and some are. So uh, we're also told, for example, speculation is not permissible. Um, you're not, you shouldn't speculate with your money. Uh, we're told gambling is not permissible. Um, and so from these very, very simple rules, I would say, it gives us the framework to, to develop more complex principles. And, and I think th that's broadly where we're coming from is that Islam sets for us, sets down for us certain sets of principles which should be our starting point. And from there, we can derive economic systems. Uh, why is it wrong to charge an interest on a loan? So uh, if you want to lend money to somebody, they want to pay you 5%. Um, uh, they're gonna, they want to do it, you want to do it. Why should it be uh, forbidden? Could you make a case for that? Okay, so I think if we look at uh, 
two isolated parties looking to make a transaction and one wants a loan, the other one has the capital willing to give a loan. And if you look at the fact that they, uh, they mutually agree, um, then it can be argued that that transaction on its own, it, you, you can argue that it, that might not be delivering harm to anybody, especially if the repayment is within the capacity of the borrower and he repays, then you know the transaction's finished. And I agree on that isolated incident, it's difficult to evidence harm, uh, any harm that might occur. So, but we have to remember that when we humans are in situations that we don't often stick to the rules. So for example, uh, so the point I'm making is that we have to look at the potential harm that can occur and we also have to consider human nature. So for example, um, one of the reasons that uh, alcohol is made forbidden is that even though very small amounts of it might not intoxicate, but larger amounts can. And so th there's a principle that we derive from there that if there's an activity which extended use of that activity can result in harm, that's quite possible even though single isolated activities might not result in harm. So I, I think this comes back to the understanding of human nature as well, that if we are permitted a, a down a slippery slope of making a single transaction where we can charge interest, that the risk lies that this can then become systemic and become systematic. And I think that's kind of where we are today. And I think it's, it's very, it's much easier today to, to, to evidence the harm that's created by a system that's built on lending and interest. Yeah. I tend to think when I try and think about the rationale for this being uh, a bad thing, I think of it in terms of, um, as we see it in the current fiat system, when a lender has the ability to lend out at interest, they effectively have the, have the ability of increasing the money supply without actually making new gold coins or printing new paper money. So when banks lend in the fiat monetary system, that creates new money supply because they, they, they issue loans that are not necessarily, or that are mostly not backed by any kind of um, um, collateral on hand. So they're, uh, they're overextended financially. And I think the, uh, the, the way that I like to think about it is that in this kind of situation, when a person is able to lend at a fixed interest rate, their um, their fallback position is that they're going to um, r uh, take away the property of the borrower in case um, the borrower is unable to pay back. Now, yes, you can say that this is, um, you know, if, if, if the borrower and the lender agree, then why should anybody be, um, why should anybody intervene? And um, I, I understand that, but I think, you know, from the, the religious perspective, which is more of a social, uh, uh, which, which looks more at the social implications of something like this, I think the case against it is that uh, even though the two of them are able to agree, if the, the reason they agree is that we as a society normalize the idea of uh, the borrower taking the, uh, sorry, the lender taking the borrower's stuff, which effectively monetizes their collateral so that the house is basically the collateral but since the house is with the borrower it's not with the lender um it's uh, it's being used as a consumer good you know the person is living on it and at the same time it's being used as a monetary good that the bank will uh, liquidate it if the loan cannot be paid so i I mean, this is kind of obviously colored by my Austrian uh, inflationist perspective, but it disagrees with the way that the Austrians think about it. But if I were to make the case for why this is wrong, I think it's inflationary. I think that is uh, creating new money that um, makes us as a society live in a situation where new money is being created by these financial institutions that can then um, impound the property of people who aren't able to pay. And so um, the case against it is that people shouldn't, uh, I mean, people, uh, I guess the religious case against it is that as an individual, you don't want to be living in a society that accepts those things. Our guest today is Tariq Al-Diwani. Tariq is the director at Creatok Zest Limited and his book, The Problem with Interest on the Nature of Usury and Modern Banking was first published in 1997 and has attracted wide readership 
among scholars of Islamic finance, as well as scholars of Bitcoin, I should say. So we are also joined by uh, Alan Farrington here, who's recently published a book uh, titled Bitcoin is Venice. And it draws heavily on the work of uh, Tariq. And I think it's very interesting that a lot of Bitcoiners find um, the um, economic work of Tariq and Islamic finance in general um, to be relevant to the topic of Bitcoin. And I certainly think so. I'd just be really interested in your your thoughts on similarities between Austrian and Islamic economics. And I mean, I have my own, but I suspect yours will be. You give me yours, far, because then far, far I, you know, I, I need a crib sheet usually to make uh, details. Oh, sure, okay. but well, tell so, me yours. So I'll them, I tell you what, I'll, I'll set it up rather than like actually <laughs> give my uninformed take. So right. I think that they they both arrive at very similar conclusions about the role of uncertainty and therefore individual decision making in markets. But as far as I can tell, they arrive by completely different lines of reasoning. And so if you if you have a take on that, that would be fascinating. Probably safe as well, actually. I'm sure he's thought about it too. Uh, I'm going to defer to safe. I, I need to hear what he says before I open my mouth on this, I think. Um so I think the, uh, the the way that I see it is that the um, and and to follow up on what you said earlier, so the way that the Austrians um, uh, approach this topic, when when you think about it in terms of time preference and the Austrian ability to analyze time preference, um, is the key toward bridging the two uh, ideas, like the way that Islamic economics um, meets with uh, Austrian economics. From the um, Islamic compliant economics, it's a prescriptive, nor uh, prescriptive and normative statement that we want to have a low time preference and we make sure that everybody has a time preference by following the religion that says, uh, you know, you follow the religion because the religion says you can't lend at an interest. So therefore, you're essentially forced to not discount the future heavily because you can't uh, gain interest on money. You're forced to not discount the future. It kind of um, forces you to lower your time preference in a way. On the other hand, um, from the Austrian perspective, um, I think what happens, you know, Hoppe says uh, the lowering of time preference initiates the process of civilization. And in turn, the process of civilization leads to uh, a feedback, which also lowers the time preference further and further. And I think um, you arrive at a similar point. Now, here, here's where I depart from uh, Mises and Rothbard. And this is where I think people will start taking the pitchforks out. You know, my usual Austrians, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to get stoned as a heretic by the Austrians for this, I think, not by the Muslims. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, from the Austrian perspective, they they think that uh, you know time preference determines interest rates, but they don't take that to the conclusion. I think which is what what happens if time preference continues to drop? Well, what happens then is that you basically end up with a system which is similar to the one that you describe in your book, Tariq, which is uh, but but it isn't imposed through religious doctrine. It's uh, emergent on the market um, because the time preference has dropped, and now. Uh, you're, you know, you're expected to lose 1% of your money every year on storing that money. And so therefore, you're happy to take, uh, you're happy to save that 1% by giving that money to somebody else who has the legal responsibility to hand it back to you in a year. So you save 1%. And so people will lend, but only to people that they trust. And so lending without interest will be, um, you know, something that happens with friends and family mostly. But then if you want to lend for business, you don't lend, you just take equity. That's the natural thing. Like, why would you, in that situation where the, where the natural market clearing interest rate drops to zero, why would I want to invest in your business? Or even if it's very close to zero, which is the current situation, why would I want to take um sorry, not invest in your business. Why would I want to lend to your business when you're going to pay me back 0.5%, yeah. but I'm, um, you know, taking the creditor risk, which means that I could lose 100%. So um, yeah. nobody would be willing to take that situation. I think it's just, um, it, it, it's currently um, artificially imposed through the fact that we have an inflationary 
monetary system that makes it uh, yes. profitable to get into debt, even at an interest, because the money itself is being devalued. This is that's the key right. Thing. Yes, that's what makes it work very largely. I mean, for the banks, it's exactly easy to create value out of nothing. So uh, they they take the interest yield on it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, you know, historically, uh, fractional reserve banking would always be failing. And then the way that they managed to make it work in the 20th century was to destroy the currency, basically. Yeah. You're constantly bleeding the value of the currency in order to keep this um, Ponzi going. And it's essentially an intergenerational Ponzi. Future generations are paying for yeah. the conspicuous consumption of current generations. This is, this is where it has led. Yeah. And that is why I find Bitcoin and the marriage of those two topics so fascinating because, um, I mean, you know, the Bitcoin operates in a way, um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the culture around Bitcoin, but one of the most important things to understand about Bitcoin is that it bends to nobody. It just continues. It's just every 10 minutes, there's a new block and um, it's been doing this for 13 years and leaving behind a constant trail of heartbroken people crying because it won't change and do what they think is best for it to change. And um, so <laughs> we're in this kind of, natural experiment now where we're um, witnessing this growing, very, very quickly growing uh, hard money economy that can't really be stopped and is just growing. And um, it's giving us an example as it's giving people the ability to save into the future, which I think is um, uh, enormously important. And I think it's going to lower time preference all over the world. So it's going to give people the ability to save, which is going to make them start discounting the future less. And I think you see this among Bitcoiners. It's it's insanely common. I mean, I meet a lot of Bitcoiners because my book is popular with Bitcoiners. And it's incredibly common how many people will tell me this, that, you know, um, I say I used to um, spend all my money drinking and partying. And then yeah. um, I figured out that I could save Bitcoin and I found, looked at Bitcoin, understood Bitcoin. And now I don't drink, I don't party, and I put that money into uh, Bitcoin and I just hold Bitcoin. And then the entire, you see the shift, like you go from um, uh, party and, you know, time preference just can only can only see as far as next weekend and who we're going to party with to starting a family and yeah. um Thinking, you know, Bitcoiners have the grand visions of dynasties and uh, yes. intergenerational things, which really fiat people don't have because fiat people are on a treadmill that uh, means they can't see past next weekend. Um, everything is discounted. There's no easy way for providing for the future. So what happens mm -hmm. now is we keep lowering time preference because we have Bitcoin and um we are going to see a, a, an empirical test of whether what I'm saying is correct or not. We're going to see time preference continue to drop. And then I'm curious to see what happens with interest. And I think, you know, without... Well, Bitcoin would have to become the dominant system for your empirical test to work, surely. That's what we're doing. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah. I mean, yeah, been, and, uh, and how long are you expecting to do this test in the near future? I mean, I mean we're on it. Yeah. <laughs> what percentage does Bitcoin take of total turnover, transaction volume in the world on a daily basis? I think what matters is not so much the transaction volume. What matters is the percentage of cash balances. That's really the key thing. How much of the world's cash balances in Bitcoin? That's the metric. And right. currently it's at around, I say, about half a percent of global cash balances. Yeah. So still got a lot of room for growth, but um, I, you know, this is what Bitcoin does. It grows. So the the, the, the really fascinating thing here is that, um, and I, you know, there are a lot of crazy controversial ideas in Bitcoin, but I think that Bitcoin is going to effectively bring about a uh, an, an Islamic uh, kind of monetary system. Um, not through any kind of Islamic uh, yeah, uh, regulation. legislation or regulation, yeah. just simply through market incentives, because I think it fits very nicely um, with the Islamic way that you think of finance, where the money is hard, nobody can print the money. So therefore, nobody can guarantee that, you know, if you're giving away a loan and you're getting 5% back, there's nobody out there who can print Bitcoin to bail out the bank that um, yeah. is going to inevitably fall short. So people who are going to try these kind of shenanigans are going to end up basically losing their Bitcoins. And um, we're going to head toward a system in which people either lend at a basic interest rate of zero or uh, invest equity. Invest and I think it's still too equity. early to see this yeah. now, but this is how I think of it theoretically in the yeah. future.
Well, I mean, coming back to the question on uncertainty, then I think that is a you know a critical issue. Um, how does uh, you know how how does the world of Islam look at uncertainty in a financial context? And when you make the equity transaction, let's take that as a uh, you know the, the basis for, for, for that this little discussion. Um, you um, you know an interest based lender would say, well, look, uh, this is a very uncertain business. It's a startup. I will lend at twenty percent or thirty percent because there's a lot of risk here. Um, they make that judgment in advance, um, uh, quite subjectively, very often. Um, but the issue is, is it a correct apportionment of the risk? Right? If you compare it to the equity position, we make a judgment in advance, should we buy equity in this startup venture? But the actual apportionment is not based on an estimation, it's based on an actual fact, on a set of accounts with a profit number agreed according to a certain number of uh, accounting standards which people generally uh, abide by and which investors and entrepreneurs both know. Uh, and that profit figure is distributed according to a known percentage share in the equity. So the risk resolves itself into a just distribution. But yes, you make your uh, ascertainment of whether you should invest at the beginning in using your own metrics, just as an interest-based lender would. The key is that the interest rate may not match the outcome, yeah? in which case either the lender is shortchanged because the business was very successful and made a very large profit, or the lender is shortchanged because um, uh, you know, he, he, the businessman went bankrupt and uh, lost all the money and uh, he didn't pay attention to his business as well as he would have done if it had been entirely equity based. You know, there is this kind of moral hazard for a limited liability company which borrows debt and the directors can walk off scot-free if the, if the company goes bankrupt, they themselves are not on the hook. So you have this asymmetry in interest-based lending which you don't have in equity. And I will, you know, say that that way of, of, of treating uncertainty to say, yes, make your own judgment a priori, but the ex-post distribution is based on a just uh, economic calculation. I think that's the fair way of handling uncertainty, right? Um, I mean, we could go on, but let, let's just make, if I can, one more point. The financial system, and I know you want to discuss Bitcoin, <laughs> we're running out of time a bit, but the financial system that we have now um, Using the interest rate and lending as a motor of economic growth is actually one of the main uh, determinants of increasing wealth inequality. Um, we know as business people that if you want to borrow money from a bank, the, the one sure way of getting money is to already be wealthy. The bank will lend against people who have assets. Yeah, People who are poor, who don't have assets, can't borrow from the bank. So... The, what happens then is that if you you know have a society in which many people have business ideas, the ones who actually get the capital are the ones who are wealthy, because they have the security to offer as collateral to the banking system, and that keeps the wealth circulating within the wealthy. Right? If you have an equity-based system, the investor's only chance of making a profit is not by taking security on your house and selling it if your business goes bad. Yeah? It's by sharing your profit. Yeah? So they want to invest in people who have good ideas and who make profit. Right? And a poor person can have just as good ideas as a rich person. Right? So under the equity system, the key is not the level of wealth that you already have when you make your application for finance. The question is, how good is your idea? How good is your management? How good is your experience? And wealth is not such a central determinant of who gets the funds under an equity-based system. So I would actually say that you know to welcome uncertainty and treat it in the right way actually uh, is not only just morally and uh, you know it's actually something which helps us from the uh, economic point of view to reduce the terrible wealth inequality that we're suffering yeah i should uh, i should say here um you know we've hosted uh, michael saylor and um in my book the fiat standard you know it's it, it's kind of like a user manual to how to use the fiat system based on the fact that it is a monetary system that is inflationary um sailor offers basically he says this is what rich people do everywhere i think it's very correct and when you understand how fiat works it makes a lot of sense what rich people do everywhere is that they have assets and they borrow against them and they borrow in the currency that is depreciating and so their yep. debt is constantly getting cheaper to repay 
and they generate cash flow from these uh, businesses that more than covers the debt because the debt is very long term. And so they just keep rolling it over and they live off of it. And the way that this system is done, the way that this system works is that it allows uh, people who own money, who have wealth to just keep the wealth there without having to actually do anything with it, just uh, use it to borrow against it. And this is effectively what Sailor is doing um, with Bitcoin in that he's borrowing fiat, using his company to borrow fiat to buy Bitcoin, which um, is, <laughs> it's, it's a great because it's kind of, a, it's, a, it, it's the way that we uh, euthanize this insane system where right, if right. everybody yeah. keeps borrowing and then uh, buying Bitcoin. Um, eventually we end up with more Bitcoin than US dollar debt and uh, eventually we euthanize uh, the bond market and uh, people <laughs> use uh, Bitcoin as their saving, uh, as their medium of saving. I mean, this is really the plan. I've, I've said this before. Um, the appetizer for Bitcoin is the gold market we're going to take the share of gold as a store of value. But the main course is the bond market. The main course is people stop holding bonds for the long term and they start holding equity and Bitcoin. And Bitcoin well, it's, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of crunch point that's coming in the sense that the bond market has been held up by creation of fiat money. Uh, you know, governments yeah. have been supporting bonds. And yet that very act... Uh, supports the price of bonds, stops them falling, stops the interest rates going up. So you have an inflationary environment which keeps the interest rate low, which is an astonishing uh, uh, kind of uh, contradiction, you know, in economic terms. Um, and uh, yeah, where that resolves itself too will be is a very interesting point, actually, that's coming, I think, fairly soon. Yeah, and I think the, the way to think of it is that initially people used to save in gold, and then they took the gold and then they gave them physical money and told them it's okay, um, you, you'll get it's going to be better because you put the money in a bank account and you get an interest rate, yeah. and you don't need the physical gold. That was in like the 1930s, and bank interest rates for a while could keep up with inflation, but that of course was unsustainable, um, and it led to banking crises and all kinds of problems, and then interest rates went down. And then they couldn't keep up with inflation. So you had to go to the bond market to save. And that was, of course, great for the government because you're buying bonds from governments and that's financing them and it's allowing them to create money and create debt and spend insane amounts of money on all kinds of insane sorts of things. But that was also a Ponzi and it was not sustainable. So the bond market couldn't keep up. And now the bond, you know, bonds don't beat inflation. So people have moved to stocks. Now stocks are the way to beat inflation. And so people put their saving account in the stock index, which basically is the way to try and uh, beat inflation. If you don't have access to the stock index, you're getting ruined by inflation. Um, you, you have no easy um, refrain from it. It's just constantly robbing everybody in the world who has cash and um, bank accounts as saving assets and rewarding people who have access to uh, US government credit at low interest rates. So it's a massively unfair system, but it's coming, I think, to... Um, to, to a point, I mean, it is it is an unsustainable Ponzi, and I think uh, the way out of this is uh, Bitcoin. So that brings us to Bitcoin. So, what do you think about Bitcoin? Are you orange billed yet? <laughs> People, uh, I mean, have have asked me uh, to sort of pin my flag to uh, look. I think uh, one can look at this again from a, you know a legal perspective and, and ask questions. If you want the the Sharia perspective on it. Um, you know, then I can tell you that there are certain issues which need to be discussed. And I think perhaps those discussions have not advanced as quickly as they should have done, uh, you know, given the growth in public interest. But, um, you know, there is a general point in, in Sharia that, uh, you know, wealth is anything that's useful uh, and property is wealth that can be owned. So, you know, there are some kinds of wealth that can't be owned, uh, like sunlight uh, or a beautiful view. Uh, or some public, uh, like water, for example, underneath the ground, is definitely wealth because it has a use, and wealth is anything that's useful to society. Um, but some kinds of wealth can't be owned. Now, one has to go through this process, asking, is it wealth? If it's owned wealth, then it's, it's property. Uh, is it a valid form of, uh, of property, therefore? Um, and is it then the kind of property that you can trade? Um, uh, and there is this progression of questions. So it's well known, I think, in Sharia that some kinds of uh, uh, item are not regarded as wealth at all, like alcohol, for example, or pork. You cannot sell that if you try to in a transaction. The transaction is void. Um, 
and, and there are some kinds of wealth which are useful, but you cannot sell, right? If we ask these questions about Bitcoin, then we, we can come to a position where we can say, well, what is it itself? It is um, uh, potentially, under one view, uh, a receipt for ownership of, of something. Uh, as a title is to a house, for example, at a land registry, right? You have a document which gives evidence of ownership of a property, right? And for tokens on the cryptocurrency system, then I think that's a fairly good analogy. You know, a token gives you a right utility token or an asset token to a particular, you know, service or, 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 or asset or a share in it. Um, and I think there is generally no uh, disagreement now among uh, modern scholars that uh, a receipt, a warrant, a warehouse receipt can be used to trade copper or, you know, uh, assets of that nature. This is not actually what cryptocurrency is, I think. I think we have to pass by that potential um, uh, characterization and ask, about a second form of characterization, which is that it is a kind of digital asset in the same way that, for example, a digital copy of my book might be uh, an asset. It exists on a database, it's electronic, um, and people can buy that because it has a utility. Um, you can use it uh, for your benefit and you can value it whatever you want. If you want to pay a thousand pounds for it, you can. If you, you know, if I'm prepared to sell it for one pound, I can. Um, and again, I think that's not what we're talking about here with um, cryptocurrency. What we seem to be looking at with uh, the, the um, uh, non-tokenized cryptocurrency is a database entry. Okay? Uh, and the question that we have to ask, uh, I think an analogy is helpful. I can say to you, look, uh, you know, uh, a record on a database is, is a record of a, a thing that exists outside of the database. Uh, if I have a house, uh, I can certainly buy and sell the record of the house, which is on an electronic database. But the thing that gives the record value is the asset that stands behind it. I can live in a house. I can't live in a database record, right? We have to ask the question, is uh, Bitcoin uh, an electronic uh, work of art, for example, of intellectual property, which I can buy and sell? Or is it some conceptual value that, is, that exists as a record on a database? Um, then the question becomes, um, should we be using this as a kind of money? Now, I, again, just a couple of minutes on this, and then you can tell me what, what your thoughts are and where you want to go. Um, there are Muslim scholars who have said, and these are very literalist ones, that only gold and silver can be money, and that indeed God created gold and silver to be money. Right. And they have taken a very literalist position and an exclusive position and say that gold and silver is the only form. There's a very close connection with what the Austrians have said in the past on this. Right? Um, there are other scholars who said that gold and silver can be money and you cannot prohibit them being used as money because the Prophet, peace be upon him, used them as money and you cannot prohibit what the Prophet permitted. Right? Um, so uh, we... Uh, have those scholars who perhaps sit in the middle, and then there are those scholars who are perhaps the most liberal ones who say that we use the objectives of Sharia, justice, stability, and so forth, to judge what should be money. Um, and any system which has low cost or lower cost, that has security, that has justice, safety, transparency, uh, can be used, right? And these ones tend more to support, they have even supported, for example, the fiat money system in the past by saying, look, you know, it costs a lot of money to dig gold out of the, the earth. Why do we spend all this money when we can have a cheap system producing paper at very little cost? Right? So you have this range of opinions. One thing that I would say is that at the time uh, of uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, they were discussing using camel skin as leather. Right? They had that discussion. They decided not to. Not because they thought that gold and silver only should be money, but because they thought that too many camels would be killed in the race to acquire camel skin money, right? This is a very important point because it means that something that is permitted, a camel and camel skin, and you can sell and buy camel skin, right, was not adopted on 
the wider economic case that we don't want to go destroying our stock of camels in a race for money. And remember that this has many feedbacks in it. Money is something that is used to buy things. If we kill all the things that we would buy, <laughs> if we destroy them, well, then what's the point in having money? So there has to be a balance. This, you know, and this is one thing that is in favour of gold and silver that, you know, gold and silver is produced if the value of money is high. In other, if, if there's a shortage, because the cost of buying the capital equipment to mine the gold and silver will be low when the cost of money is high. Yeah? When, when when gold is expensive, it means capital prices are low. Yeah, so the one is the corollary of the other. So shortage of money. Uh, gold expensive, prices low, buy capital equipment, produce gold, gold supply increases, prices decrease, capital equipment becomes expensive, can't buy capital equipment to produce gold because there's not a profit in it. And the, so we have this kind of level, you know, there's a natural balance. And we have to think about, you know, these wider economic connotations and not just look at the narrow legal position. But that narrow legal position is where I believe we start. So question, is it a receipt for ownership? Is it digital art, intellectual property of a kind? Is it a conceptual a value that resides on a database and we use it because it's cheaper, more transparent, so forth, and we justify it on the objectives of the religion? I, I would say it's not a receipt it, it, because it is the good in itself. So this, a lot of people say, well, Bitcoin is backed by nothing. And the answer to that is Bitcoin is itself the backing of other things. You can have things backed by Bitcoin. In other words, gold is not backed by anything either. It itself has its value. Um, I think the best way to think about Bitcoin, perhaps from this uh, perspective, is that it is the, um, it is the monetary uh, properties of gold. Um, separated from the physical properties of gold. So it's like a form, a new, a new chemical. You know, if you want a new periodic element in the, in the periodic table that has no electrons, no photons, and uh, no protons, uh, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not physical. It's similar to gold in its economic properties. And I think the key thing, you know, the, the, the story of camels, I had not heard this one before, and I find it really fascinating, the idea that uh, they'd use this. So in, in the Bitcoin standard, I discussed this, um, you know, why gold and silver end up being money. And it is um, precisely because they have the lowest supply growth rate. Uh, because it's just very hard to increase more, find more. Yeah, stock versus flow. And I, I read the, the whole book. I thought it was very good, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to hear that. So it is the stock to flow. And the problem with camel as money is not, as you say, it's not that it is not yellow and shiny like uh, gold or silver. The problem with camel as money is that you can just kill all the camels and then you have a lot of money and then you don't have any camels and then you starve. Um, so you want something that is not easy for anybody else to produce. You don't want copper, for instance. You don't want nickel. You don't want oil because people just make more and more of this and then they'll bring the price down. So Bitcoin takes that economic property, which is the difference between camel and silver and gold, the difference between oil and gold, the difference between copper and gold, and codifies it into software and allows you to buy it digitally. Now, yes, you can't hold it physically, but um, just because you can't hold it physically, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. I mean, um, and, and I think this shouldn't be something difficult for a, uh, a Muslim scholar to understand. Um, it, it, it Just because it doesn't exist physically doesn't mean it doesn't have value. And the reason is, you know, even though it doesn't exist physically, it's just say a number or a series of uh, uh, characters that you memorize, you are able to use it in the same way in which you use gold. In other words, you can click these numbers into the right machine at the right time and you can pay me and you can make transfer of a payment for me. So it performs all of the functions of gold. It's like a way of buying this new chemical, this new uh, element on the periodic table that is uh, like gold, but better, but doesn't have any of the physical properties. So I am no sheikh, but I don't see uh, a reason why this would be haram. The reason there's nothing haram in Bitcoin is that once you step away from the fact that it's not physical and you just accept the fact that when we've built a digital world, then there will be economic goods that are non-physical. And I think domain names are a great example. www.amazon.com is not a physical thing. You can't kick it. You can't drop it on your toes. Uh, and yet you can't just own amazon.com. It's uh, good luck trying to buy it. 
it. It's going to cost, well, I mean, I can imagine probably uh, Bezos would charge a trillion dollars probably before he sells this domain name. And it's nothing physical. He's not going to lose a single physical thing from his house or from all of his company, but he could sell the rights to that domain. So I think perhaps with a lot of Muslims, what the sticking point is, is that they conflate the non-physical nature of Bitcoin with the riba of the uh, fiat money. In other words, they get that there's something fishy about uh, dollars and about the fact that central banks create dollars. And so they're receptive to that idea that, yeah, we should be on gold, we should be on silver because it's, it's what the Quran says. And there's clearly something wrong here. Uh, most Muslims will entertain that. But in their mind, Bitcoin comes in the tank of riba because it's unlike gold and silver, it's not physical. And like fiat money, it's just an entry on a database. And so therefore, there must be somebody out there who can control it. But I think you hit on something very profound, which is that the fact that it's not manipulable, nobody can just control the supply, is what takes it from the bucket of fiat and puts it in the bucket of gold, in my opinion, even though it's not physical. And so then the question becomes, well, why are people using it? It's the same reason they use physical things and other non-physical things, which is that it has a value for you. And uh, a lot of people have a value for Bitcoin. And so you can use it as a money because you buy it, other people buy it, and you can sell it on. And then I think the compelling aspect of it is that it's hard. There's no authority anywhere that has ever been able to make Bitcoin at a discount. There's nobody who has a printer that can make Bitcoin at a discount. Nobody who will ever do that. Well, you know, never, ever big words. But the more you study in Bitcoin, the more you realize uh, how difficult it would be for somebody to try and enforce a change on the money supply or, or a way to corrupt it. And, and that, I think, is the key to the appeal. And I think when you start thinking about the implications for a monetary system built on Bitcoin, that's when the connections with Islamic finance begin to really shine. And it's something that I've thought about for quite a while. And then I saw, I hadn't written about it yet, but I am writing a little bit about it in uh, the fiat standard. I think with a hard monetary system, I don't really see how, well, with something like Bitcoin, where, you know, Bitcoin has, uh, first of all, it's hard, so nobody can print it. And secondly, it's also highly saleable across space. So you can move it around very easily and very cheaply. You can transfer it halfway around the world for a few dollars and a few hours. And so the more honest the money and the better the money in terms of its saleability uh, across time and across space, the better it's going to be at performing the function of money. And I think Bitcoin finance will naturally end up looking more like Islamic finance, not through any kind of religious edict. It's not because uh, Muslims are going to embrace Bitcoin and force it to become Islamic. I think the nature of Bitcoin is only going to lend itself to the kind of finance that will emerge, the kind of finance that is compatible with the spirit of Sharia law, I would say, regardless of whether it's compatible with the letter of the law, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's always been strange to me that uh, Muslims will argue that just because it's not physical, it can't be money. I mean, there's nowhere in Islamic jurisprudence that says that money has to be asset backed or physical or have utility other than as money. There's nowhere that says that. So we can use Although wouldn't you wouldn't you say that uh, it specifically specifies gold and silver and then because since it's uh, in- I mean, uh, there are six categories of Rebawi uh, commodities, including gold and silver and wheat and barley, and I think dates and I think salt. And these are things that may be used as currency. In other words, we may use other things if we have social concurrence that we may use them as a form of currency. Mm-hmm. But it okay. doesn't necessarily say that they have to have utility as something. There's nowhere that it says that. So when Muslims say that, I question that. I say, where? Show me exactly where in the original theological texts does it actually say you need to have real physical asset backing? It doesn't. Besides, the money in your bank account is just digits in a computer somewhere. You think they actually hold 10 pound notes or 10 pounds worth of gold in their vaults relating to the 10 pounds that you have in your bank account? No. So, I mean, you know, I think this is a fallacy and, and Muslims would do well to research this and, and realize that social concurrence is more important than a real asset backing. Yeah, absolutely. I, one thing struck me in your article, which I think is scary and profound, is just the way that a lot of these fatwas are going on Bitcoin, 
we could be seeing a replay of the printing press, of people just saying, well, the printing press was haram, and that knocked literacy back for centuries in Islamic countries, because a lot of people thought that it was haram because you could print bad things on paper. So clearly, we should ban printing. And this is very similar to the logic of no coiners today who say, well, you can do bad things with Bitcoin, therefore Bitcoin is bad. But yeah, I think um, it could be tragic. If the next 10, 20 years as Bitcoin continues to grow, as I think and expect it will be, if uh, the majority of the Muslim world is frozen out because their muftis are telling them that this is haram, they're just going to end up eventually, Bitcoin's not going to go away, I think. And if it continues to impose itself, the only effect of these fatwas will be that uh, Muslims will buy 5, 10, 15, 20 years later than they otherwise would have. Yeah, I read a very interesting thing within the last one, maybe two weeks, who is one of the leading scholars in the Islamic world on the subject of Islamic finance, who has um, historically been very forward thinking on a lot of uh, new products in the Islamic finance space. But he recently indirectly issued a fatwa on this, which I found very disappointing because he essentially quoted the usual very strange things that people, scholars in particular, say about Bitcoin, which is that it's speculative and therefore it's it's not compatible with our values. It's an international underplot was the words that he used, which I, again, I find a little bit bizarre. It's not asset backed, which again, as I've explained, there's nowhere in Sharia that it says it has to be asset backed. The thing that disturbed me most of all was the fact that he said he would revisit this in future this fatwa, his, this legal opinion of his, maybe it could happen in the future. Maybe it could be Sharia compliant in the future. And I'm thinking, yeah, but when? When we're all poor and everybody else is rich and we cannot climb out of that social injustice that we're in now? I mean, why tell me that in 20 years time when Bitcoin has been mined and uh, it's whatever, a million dollars per coin? Don't tell me that in 20 years time. Tell me that now. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I was disappointed by that. I had huge respect for many of these scholars, in particular Mufti Taki Usmani is a hero and mentor of mine. But uh, there comes a point at which even my dear father and my dear father-in-law, I love them and respect them a great deal. But at some point I had to take the car keys away from them. And I think that's what's happening right now. I think we need to take away some of that authority from some of these scholars because this is too specialized a subject and it needs individuals who are really well versed in the technicalities of it, who really deeply understand it. I am seeing that happening, by the way. A lot of young scholars coming forward with extremely good credentials. They are very networked in the finance space. They understand modern finance and modern monetary system. They have come out with their own papers, their own research on Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that many of them are beginning to come around to it and saying, actually, hey, there's something here, guys. This really could be a, a monetary system that is very compatible with our faith for the reasons that it's not inflationary and it's decentralized, it's non-manipulatable, it's divisible, it has social acceptance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all the characteristics of a sound money. So we should really look at it carefully. And they haven't dismissed it out of hand, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see that. Yeah, I certainly hope so. I think, strangely enough, there were, maybe this is just my impression, but I think a few years ago, there were probably a few more positive rulings on this. But now I think the, the tide is turning toward uh, more negative rulings on this. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, as you said, what they're missing in this picture is that, um, <laughs> is what I like to call Bitcoin's number go up technology. And I think that the way to communicate, the way I try and communicate it to people is that you hear about Facebook or Amazon or Google or Netflix coming up and taking over the world. And you might not be convinced of that. And so you think, well, Facebook, this thing sounds silly or Google sounds silly. And so you don't join. But then, you know, five years later, you decide, all right, well, this thing isn't going away. All my friends are there and all they're all using it and they can't shut up about it. So I am guess I'm going to set up myself up an account with this uh, service, whether it's Facebook or Google. Five years later, 10 years later, you start your Facebook, Google, Amazon account. It functions every bit as well as uh, the person who's been there for 10, 15 years. You still get the same search results. Well, you still some get the same algorithms uh, to manipulate your search result and his and you still get you know the same uh, shows on Netflix you still get the same uh, goods available on Amazon there's not much of a change in the consumer experience depending on when you join but Bitcoin your experience with Bitcoin is highly highly <laughs> correlated with your time of joining I mean the earlier you join the more satoshis you get and it's very straightforward this is the part that i don't like about uh, <laughs> number go up technology because when you're trying to say this you sound like you're trying to sell people on uh, a ponzi scheme but the reality of it is that there's only 21 million and that's it and you may not like that fact you may think it's not fair 
But that's how it goes. And I think really getting Bitcoin, putting aside the technical aspects of it, but getting the importance of Bitcoin for you is in that one moment when you realize, okay, all of my big braining and all of my reasons and all of my ideas, all that they're doing is they're just raising my buy-in price. If I change my mind one day, they're not going to go and say, all right, well, he's changed his mind. Let's start all over again and redistribute the Bitcoin so that everybody has their fair share based on how much money they had earlier. This is the reallocation of wealth that is happening by replacing an entire uh, monetary system with a new one. And this is the new real estate. Think about it as if they're going to shut down the Suez Canal and dig a new Suez Canal. And we know where the real estate for the new Suez Canal is going to be. And it's happening. You can see that the thing is happening. And I think if you have a business that is reliant on the Suez Canal, the sooner you buy up the real estate around the new Suez Canal, the better off you're going to be. Trying to delay it and waiting and saying, well, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're only missing out on it yourself. You're not hurting anyone but yourself. That's the really uh, sad part about it, I think. That's really right. Yeah. On the question of interest, I'm of the view that I think in a Bitcoin-only economy, you would not get interest lending. And as I was saying earlier, it would look like an Islamic Sharia-compliant economy because I can't see there would be interest lending. What are your views on this? And what do you think? Yeah, I think I used to think that. And then I've seen some chatter on social media about how to create an interest-bearing banking type system off of the back of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And Although, of course, we can't magic money out of thin air if we have a finite decentralized cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, just in the same way we can't magic gold out of thin air, we have to mine it first. The reality is that once we have an economy that's functioning on Bitcoin, there will be some enterprising individual who will come along and work out how to lend that interest against that. I think it makes it much harder because you can't have a fractional reserve banking system if the economic model is only based on Bitcoin and not on fiat. You can't print more of it. You can't take in a dollar of deposit and lend out $10 a deposit because you'd have to create those nine extra dollars, right? You'd have to mine those nine extra dollars or nine extra units or satoshis or whatever of Bitcoin. So I used to think that if we had a Bitcoin only economy, you could never have riba. You could never have interest in the economy. But I think we will find that many organizations will come forward and be able to move away from the idea of a bank as a custodial service only towards a bank as a lender at interest. It will be much, much harder. and Therefore, you would be able to deleverage the economy in a way that's not possible today. But I think it will happen. I don't think we'll be able to prevent that. So you know, I think there are many characteristics of Bitcoin that means we will move towards a more socially just economic model but I don't think we'll be able to completely erase what I think is the curse of interest. I think obviously eliminating it completely is arguably impossible. There will always be people who want to engage in it. But I I think as a financial system overall, I don't see how it can uh, continue to play a main role. And I think there are a couple of reasons to think about it. On the one hand, you've got the problem of fractional reserve banking and rehypothecation is essentially only workable, only stable, with a lender of last resort. I think this is what the 20th century has shown us. Basically, the reason that uh, the gold standard continued to have crises all the time was because banks would engage in fractional reserve banking and then discover, oh no, we don't have a gold printer, so we can't meet all of our gold obligations. And effectively going off the gold standard was done in order to help banks avoid the reckoning of the fractional reserve banking. So when banks would engage in credit expansion, and the credit expansion would increase across the US economy, it would always lead to corrections. And when there was no central bank, those corrections were generally smaller because if there was no central bank to print the money, you get found out and then your bank is out of business and then your employees and capital gets redistributed to other uh, banks who are more prudent until they stop being prudent and then (laughs) they get wiped out. So it wasn't perfect, but it had that control mechanism of eventually there could be a bank run. 
And so the only way that this was prevented and the only way that they were able to prevent us from uh, bringing down uh, banks repeatedly was to set up central banks. And so the role of the central bank would be that it would hold the gold and it would allow people to use papers. And so then when there is a liquidity shortage, it's easier for the central bank to create money in order to solve that liquidity shortage when the money is paper. And so I'm summarizing, of course, a lot, but basically the transformation of the monetary system in the 20th century was one where we created the lender of last resort to rescue banks in order to allow them to engage in fractional reserve banking. And as a result, that ended up opening the floodgates of inflation, because if you can devalue the currency for rescuing banks, then you can also devalue it for war, and you can devalue it for all kinds of election slogans that become popular. And then basically people start voting essentially for Christmas wish lists of anything because the government has a printer. So all of it ultimately comes down to the fact that there is a lender of last resort. You remove the lender of last resort, and then you have financial institutions that have a very strict limit on how much liabilities they can issue because if they issue liabilities more than the assets they hold, they can be subject to a bank run. And I think in a Bitcoin economy, this is much more likely to happen than a gold economy because there are significant costs to moving gold around. There are very strong monopolies for gold clearance that were tied into government back in the 19th century. So you, it wasn't very easy for somebody to just go and set up a gold bank. And it's not uh, easy to set it up just for logistical reasons. So the gold business lends itself, or, or gold's spatial saleability limitations, the high cost of moving gold around, lends itself for giving the banker an edge and an advantage over their client. Because, all right, you can go to the bank and withdraw your gold if you think they're engaging in fraud, but then what are you going to do with your gold? Your gold without the bank rails is pretty useless. You can only use it to buy things from the store next door. And as the world economy became more and more sophisticated, you needed to buy things from more people and your business had to import and export things. And so your gold coin without the bank's rails is pretty useless. And this is where I think Bitcoin really makes a difference because Bitcoin's spatial saleability is much higher than gold. The cost of organizing a bank run essentially or the, on your bank is much lower. It's just one transaction fee to demand that the bank pays you out. You don't have to stand in line. You don't have to wait until opening hours and they can't play the same tricks that banks usually play, which is make people wait and delay them and stall them in order to hope that they go away before they run out of money. So it makes things more transparent. And of course, because the blockchain is publicly available and transparent, you can keep good tabs on your financial institution's holdings. And you know, obviously, there's still room for fraud always. But with traceability of funds available on the blockchain, you can keep a very good eye on what they're doing. And I think with time, I see a convincing reason for why gold banks could get away with inflation and printing 10% more paper than they have or 20%, I can see how they can get away with it. Because if you think about it as in the value that they provide to their customers is so large that the customers having gold on the banking platform essentially has a 10, 20% premium over having gold in your pocket because you can send the gold in their platform much faster. So people are essentially willing to put up, even if they're not consciously willing to put up, just the economics of it end up making sense that even when the bank is messing around, it still makes economic sense for you to keep your money there and take on the risk because that's how you can continue to operate your business. Otherwise, you go out of business. So I can see the case for why you can get these margins and banks can have the ability to mess around when they're limited with a money that has saleability across space like that of gold. But I can't see that happening in Bitcoin. In fact, I think if you do end up doing something like this, you engage in fractional reserve banking, if you engage in interest rate lending, effectively what you're doing is you're creating liabilities on yourself for Bitcoins that you don't have. And your liabilities in a Bitcoin economy will trade on the market and will be exchangeable to Bitcoin. And so if you're a financial institution and you issue, say, accounts backed by Bitcoin and you give them to people so that they can use these accounts, there's going to develop a premium or, or there will be a discount on your Bitcoin if you increase the supply of your Bitcoin. And, and people don't even need to know that you are engaging in fractional reserve banking. These things will emerge 
very quickly on the market just because if you're printing more of these, then there will be more people selling them for real Bitcoin and then there will be differential in the price. And that premium reflects the fact that your Bitcoin liabilities or your Bitcoin IOUs are not as scarce as the Bitcoin backing them. There is a little bit of a discrepancy between your the number of IOUs that you have and the number of uh, coins that you have. And so in that case, I think if it does emerge, it'll be at a far smaller scale. Mm. And I don't see it being sustainable. This is one argument I have. I'm curious as to what I you think. I think we'll see alternative mechanisms arising because, I mean, I think hopefully we agree that credit is a socially useful function. I mean, there is a need for credit in society. And we probably also agree that if there is a Bitcoin standard and if the global monetary system works on this basis, then we are likely to see an overall deleveraging and a removal of interest in many cases from society. That said, I think there are a number of financing mechanisms that are good risk sharing mechanisms, real economy financing mechanisms that we're trying to employ in the Islamic finance industry today. And to a degree, some of them are synthetic versions of what's already ver available in the fiat banking systems, and therefore maybe not as pure as they should be in relation to the Islamic economic model. But others are a bit more risk sharing. And I think we'll see the emergence of those mechanisms, profit and loss sharing mechanisms, in the same manner as we once saw merchant capitalism in the early days of Islam. So the prophet himself, for example, was a mudarib, a manager of other people's money. He was a merchant who took that capital and, and traded it with goods and services. And that return to a purer form of profit and loss sharing is a form of credit mechanism that I think is a useful one and, and, and socially useful to society. I agree. And this was the second point that I was going to make, which is that when you think that there's no lender of last resort who can print Bitcoin and there's no monetary authority that can uh, force you to accept its liabilities as being equivalent on face value to Bitcoin, well, then I think the uh, model for financing is going to switch more toward an equity model rather than a credit model. And I think it's for the reasons that you mentioned. And it's because the risk sharing is unfair in the case of RIBA. Think of it this way. If there's no central bank that can print money, then your bank offering you, say, a promise of a return of 5% at the end of the year, it's not a promise. They can't keep that promise. They don't have an FDIC that can uh, come and print them dollars in order to match all their liabilities as long as they're abiding by the law. And so risk is always present in human uh, affairs, and there's always going to be real risk, and there's always going to be risk of complete wipeout. You can get completely wiped out. So it's not just that they can't guarantee you the 5% return. They can't guarantee you the 100% principle that you put in, that you could get wiped out entirely. The company could get wiped out in a storm or an earthquake or a pandemic or whatever, and the company goes out of business the bank can't get your principal back and they can't pay you the interest. So where are they going to get the $105 to pay you back at the end of the year for the 100 that you gave them? If we move toward an economy with no central bank, people will eventually learn that lesson, whether they learn it the easy way or the hard way. They'll eventually find out that when you're taking a loan for 5%, you're basically a sucker in, in that economy because you're taking on 100% of the risk. Because if there is a wipeout of the company, you are going to get wiped out and the bank is going to get wiped out. So you're taking on 100% of the risk. You're taking on 100% of the downside and you're getting a very limited upside. No matter how well the company does, you can only get 5%. And I don't see the value from that. I can see that people would stick to a fixed return as long as it was guaranteed. So your saving account is guaranteed by the FDIC. And therefore, it makes sense for you to put money from an economic perspective, even if you might not agree with it from a Sharia perspective, it makes sense to have your money in a saving account that pays an interest rate that is higher than inflation, or at least higher than uh, holding cash under your mattress, which is going to be destroyed by inflation over time. At least if you get some interest on a saving account, you'll slow down the decay of value. But in a system when there's no FDIC, because there's no magic Fed printer to make more money, then taking on a fixed interest loan just means that you're limiting your upside while taking on all the downside. And I don't see how that business model survives very long. Yeah, so now imagine that you're in a fully equity financing economy where capital is directed to those projects which have the most real economy impact. Now you're not financing zombie companies, which is what's happening today, right? This is a really key point. And I think that this shift towards an equity 
financing economy is entirely compatible with the risk sharing economic model of Islamic finance. I think there's also some kind of philosophical background to this as well. And again, I find it interesting the the parallels between Islamic philosophy and Bitcoin philosophy, things like low time preference, delayed gratification. These are actually, in a sense, part of the core values of the best people considered in Islamic thought. The best people have sabr, they have patience, they are forbearing, they are steadfast. And that implies an individual who is patient, who is self-disciplined. I mean, it's a bit like fasting, isn't it? When you fast, you are disciplining your body, you're disciplining your mind, you're inculcating values of delayed gratification. You are against consumerism. I think consumerism is incentivized by inflationary you know, money creation. And we'd be moving away from that. So actually, philosophically, this risk-sharing equity-based economy under a Bitcoin standard is very close to Islamic thought and also social justice, the reduction in wealth inequality, the reduction in conflict between people. You talk a lot about this in your book, about how we've had stable periods of history where there's been a gold standard, where there's been technological and scientific and artistic advancement when there has been a gold standard. And again, that's very compatible with Islamic thought. When you have a a stable, sound currency, you have periods of development of human civilization because we are more predisposed towards delayed gratification. I think that is entirely compatible between Islam and and, and Bitcoin. Absolutely. I I saw a piece a couple of weeks ago about somebody writing about fasting and Bitcoin and uh, fasting and hodling and how the two essentially draw on on the same muscle inside you, which is your willpower, your ability to actualize what you want and your ability to do what you want rather than what temptation wants you to do. I definitely see that. And I think my own thinking on time preference is heavily influenced by a lot of these things that I've learned about the Islamic version of living the good life, for sure. One other point that I'd like to add on terms of the way in which I see finance, the business model in fiat is to print money by lending it. You see why there's an enormous incentive for everybody to borrow for everything, for your car, for your business, for your house, your municipality and your local government and your national government and every single multinational corporation, everybody's in debt. There's nobody who's not in debt. I mean, not nobody, but basically the richer you are, the more debt you take on. The the world's richest people are also the world's biggest borrowers because they take on a lot of financing. In fiat, this is a freak of nature that is a result of the fact that we run a monetary system where the money is depreciating and the money is printed by borrowing. And so the optimal strategy in the fiat world is to try and make your balance of the fiat token itself as negative as possible. And the trick to do that is to hold a lot of hard assets so you can borrow against them so that you can continue to borrow more fiat. Like You win in fiat if you owe a lot of fiat and if you hold a lot of hard assets. This really became clear to me thanks to Michael Saylor and uh, the the few interviews we've had in this podcast, which I highly recommend everybody listen to. It's absolutely mind-blowing the way he explains it. And it dovetails perfectly with the way that I think about fiat. It's just borrowing is essentially a tax on the rest of society and a subsidy to you. And so if you're not borrowing, if you're a Muslim living in a fiat-based society and you refuse to take part of borrowing, you're effectively subsidizing everybody else. You're losing, you're a loser, yeah. Yeah, you're paying to subsidize everybody else. And that's why, in a sense, you can be a little finicky about, oh, well, the Islamic finance is is not exactly real Islamic finance, but you can also, the technological reality of the money that is available for people today, if you wanted to use a bank, if you wanted to transfer money from your country to uh, another country, the reality is you have to play with this stupid broken casino system. And um, it, it's almost like the only way you live in a town where the only way that you can eat is that at the end of the day, you take your wages and you have to take them to the casino and spend an hour gambling. You, you may come out with money after uh, you go to the casino. You may win, you may lose. But if you don't go to the casino, you don't get to eat almost. Or you, you get to just give your money or most of your money to people who are going to go gamble with it anyway. And you're not going to gamble with it. So it's, it's a really tough pickle it's amazing how Bitcoin fixes this because it fixes it in a very technological way, not in a uh, religious way, which is that it stops the monetization of debt. And so I think the potential for Muslims to like Bitcoin, if they just get this point, which is that it's how we get rid of riba. If it's how we unwind riba. If you do that, I don't see that there would be such a strong incentive for people to borrow. Like I think if you want exposure to somebody else, if if you want to earn money, 
it's just going to make more sense for you and for them uh, with a hard money, proper monetary system. It's going to make more sense for you and them to uh, get into an equity deal. And so you both share the upside and you both share the downside. And I think the reason that people don't see this right now, the reason everybody is a borrower and a lender, everybody lends money and borrows money, is that there's an enormous incentive for being a borrower and a lender in this fiat system. But I think an honest money takes that away. Yeah, 100% agree. And, and also worth adding, I think that, again, in the Islamic uh, philosophy, to die with a debt on your shoulders that has not been repaid is a sin. It, not, it needs to be repaid. And yet we live in a world in which we are encouraged to take on debt and to own hard assets. The direct consequence of that is wealth inequality. If you are able to borrow, if you are able to hold these hard assets, which are then inflated, 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 you get richer. But those at the bottom of the pyramid have no chance. Absolutely. When Michael Saylor was explaining it, he was saying the goal is to die with as much debt as you possibly can get. And like, that's really the way to win in the fiat system. And the way he explains it is, you know, if you have a hard asset, you borrow against it. And because it's constantly getting inflated, if the asset is appreciating more than the inflation is eating up in its value, then you basically never have to pay off the loan because you, you can borrow increasing quantities and the value of your loan is constantly devaluing. And so basically you can just live off of rolling over your debt, spending the money and paying off ever smaller fractions of the loan that you took on in real terms. And so as time goes by, you just continue to amass more negative fiat <laughs> points, basically. With every monetary system, people try and get as many tokens of the monetary system as they can, except with fiat. With fiat, you want to have as much debt as you can. So when you think about it, people who follow the sales strategy end up increasing their wealth massively, end up dying with a lot of hard assets and a lot of debt. And ultimately, they are being subsidized by the rest of society. And the people who subsidize them the most are the people who don't borrow at all. And that's, in many cases, the Muslims. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Uh, Zahir, you had a question? Yes, I think Yusuf has already discussed part of what I was about to ask. It's related to the misconceptions that the Muslims have about how the financial system is working. Like, people do not understand that the concept of interest or riba is haram does not apply fully under a fiat system because like if the money is inflatable then basically you are losing money and if you stay on that system and try to fix it or try to do an islamic financial uh, regulation like i don't know islamic finance i don't really understand how you can generate any sort of benefit for someone participating in that economy if the base layer is a fiat uh, money. So maybe it could be better just to tell people that if you stay on that system, you are not complying to the Sharia law that you think you are complying to. You are not doing yourself any benefit. And then the next thing is that they will suggest you a harder asset like gold or silver. And then you tell them exactly that this is bad because it was at some point the case that we are on a gold standard and the state managed to confiscate it out of our banks and then yeah the next solution is something like the bitcoin standard and this kind of uh, stands in the face of the sheikhs who try to say that bitcoin is speculative or not halal or something so why not tell them yeah but fiat is not halal and you are not saying anything like fiat is not halal and interest on fiat is not halal and the reproduction or the production of new fiat uh, tokens is not halal but yeah Interestingly, I have never heard a sheikh in any Islamic countries, especially in Arab countries, who just says that the dealing with fiat currency is haram. So thank you. I know it is not a question, it's just uh, my opinion, but I would like uh, to hear what Harris and Seif think about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, Zahir. Very good points there. I think there's two fundamental questions. The first is that I think Muslims in general have struggled to understand the value proposition that is Islamic finance versus conventional traditional finance. And the second is they have struggled to understand an even more fundamental question, which is what is the nature of money? And therefore, what is the difference between fiat money and hard money like Bitcoin? So I think the fact that they've been unable to answer the first question for themselves is partly a function of the kind of institutions that they've been served by. And certainly when I look in my own home country of the UK and I look at the leadership of UK Islamic banks, honestly, it's extremely disappointing. 
these are mainly individuals, not mainly, these are 100% individuals who do not represent, who do not look like, act like, have the same values have as the people that they serve. So it's no wonder that Muslims have not got comfortable with Islamic banking as a service to them. It's no wonder that in the UK that penetration rate is only 2% of Muslim households have an account with an Islamic retail bank. It is because they don't identify with the people who are serving them. They can't understand the value proposition. And the people who are running these organizations are unable to articulate that value proposition in accordance with the Islamic economic model. So that's been a failure. And the second Even more fundamental question is, what is the nature of money? There's no way an Islamic banker can answer that question. They simply haven't thought about it. They're so used to operating in the fractional reserve banking system that as far as they're concerned, Islamic banking is merely a synthetic replication of the conventional financial system. It's impossible for them to get their heads around anything else. So I think Muslims have been very badly served by the financial services industry. I'm seeing some very interesting developments taking place right now in fintech specifically. I hope some of them come to fruition because I think they're closer to a just economic model. And hopefully some of them will flourish even more under a Bitcoin standard. Nasser, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm from Libya and I go on long debates about Bitcoin with people recently in Clubhouse. There is a view that every type of money that should be considered Islamic has to be exchanged hand in hand. Do you know anything about this? Like, where does this come from? Yeah, there's a very simple answer to that, uh, Nasser. It's a very famous hadith in which the Prophet says that there are six categories of commodity that, can, that must be exchanged hand to hand. Gold, silver, wheat, dates, and a couple of others. I think it was barley and salt, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason why he said this is because he disallowed the trading of one of these for a greater amount in return. In other words, if I give you 100 grams of gold, you must give me 100 grams of gold back. That's what's meant by hand to hand. It doesn't literally mean physically we have to pass a bag of gold between each other. What it means is that I cannot ask for more in return, which is riba, literally an excess or a surplus. That is interest. That's what that hadith means. So when people say, oh, Bitcoin is not physical, I can't pass a Bitcoin to you, that's not at all the intent of that hadith. It's, it's nothing related to it. This refers back to what I was saying earlier, which is that uh, people conflate the non-physicality of Bitcoin with the non-physicality of fiat and then assume that it must be riba because it's not uh, hand-to-hand. But uh, you can make Bitcoin physical. You can make open dimes and you can make uh, paper wallets and you can make hardware wallets and you can trade these things hand-to-hand. And I think really... Perhaps just getting people to understand that, yeah, you could have the Bitcoin on the open dime and then you can put the money on the open dime and then you can give it to somebody else and that's it and they've taken it. I think this might be a good way of just getting the point across to people that you're not dealing with uh, fiat financial institutions, databases where uh, money is just essentially an opinion (laughs) of the people in charge. You're dealing with a hard asset and it's only digital because that's the most effective way of uh, making an asset hard that we've found. All right, uh, Daniel, you have a question? Yes, I do. Harris, thank you. This has been truly interesting and and safe as always. Whilst I was listening to this, it just kind of, I've been reading a a book. It's called Thank God for Bitcoin. And it's written by eight people, two of which, Robert Breedlove and, and Jimmy Song, huge Bitcoiners. I didn't think this would be the kind of book that I'd enjoy, but they go through it. The way it's set out is they take quotes from the Bible and then put that into a relevant day and um, spin it into, you know, Bitcoin. So, I mean, I've not read your book, Harris. Um, I'm going to have to get that one and and dig into that. But uh, I'm not sure, just having a quick look around on Amazon, whether you talked about Bitcoin in that book. So I guess my question to you is, are you going to step up and write the equivalent book for those people that are, <laughs> you might be able to orange pill a whole Muslim community and use the Quran to, to guide you? It's funny. Alhamdulillah for Bitcoin, Harris. Somebody has to write it. Alhamdulillah for Bitcoin. Do it. <laughs> I have actually been thinking about that. I've been thinking about my journey into this. It's almost like a religious journey. And I say that in the most respectful way because I'm myself a pretty conservative Muslim. I'm orthodox in my views. And I take my faith very seriously. And, you know, Bitcoin is a little bit like being a Muslim. Being a Bitcoiner is a bit like being a Muslim because when you're on the inside, Everything makes sense. It's logical. You think about things carefully. You've analyzed it carefully. And you say, this makes total sense. 
right? From the outside, people think you're insane, right? So if you're a non-Muslim, I mean, I know many non-Muslims will see me and saying, I thought you were reasonably intelligent. I mean, you believe in uh, an unseen God, you believe in heaven and hell, you have these ideas that, that don't make any rational sense, they're not proven by science. And I say, I understand why you're coming from that point of view. I personally see, you know, no incompatibility between science and my faith at all. That's the reason why I studied physics at university, to, to understand my faith even more deeply. And if anything, it reinforced my faith. So on the inside, I am told that as a Muslim, and this is what the Quran teaches me, is that uh, Islam is a religion for those who think. That's a very, very important injunction for those who think. On the inside, I see Islam as a deeply logical religion, one that's governed by social justice. And I think Bitcoin is a very similar, actually, because on the inside, they see a huge amount of social justice and logic on the inside. And yet from the outside, people are saying, oh, you're gambling, this is speculative, this doesn't make any sense, it's not real, it's not backed by anything, it's like a big plot, it's a Ponzi scheme, etc., etc." And we know, being Bitcoiners, that that's just nonsense. Whenever we read a newspaper journalist talking about the climate effect or the energy usage of Bitcoin, it's just garbage. It's based on uh, some vague understanding of a very tiny uh, subsection, sub subject within the subject of Bitcoin, and they've conflated it to mean something else. So actually, philosophically, I see many similarities between the Bitcoin community and faith-based communities. And I think that my journey within Bitcoin has been something quite interesting, almost a religious experience. So I was delivering a lecture about, I guess, four years ago, where a member of the audience, my, was my usual lecture, I usually give it a provocative title, like capitalism is broken, or the banking system must die, or something like that. And somebody in the audience asked me a question, what do you think about Bitcoin? And I said, I don't really know anything about Bitcoin, maybe you can describe it to me. And this guy said, well, you know, it has characteristics like gold because it's, you know, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. And uh, it's better than gold because, you know, it's got these other characteristics as well. And I sat back for a second. I said, oh, wow. I mean, oof, that, that's something amazing. I, I'm going to have to go away and research this. But what you've just described to me is almost the perfect Sharia compliant form of money and therefore entirely compatible with the purest form of Islamic economic model, which is based on social justice. So that's kind of almost a religious moment for me. And from that point onwards, I've kind of, and I'm no ex expert on the subject of Bitcoin, I mean, my subject is Islamic finance, but I'm seeing so much compatibility with the pure form of the Islamic economic model, which by the way, is based on universal ideas of social justice, which are equivalent across many great religions. So I think Bitcoin is a very unifying phenomenon a concept that can bring many different people from many different cultures and faiths together. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I'm tempted to write more about that.